All right, welcome to today's call, guys. Um, this is uh, an exciting one, and I told Tim before the, uh, the call that I don't get nervous for these, but um, I think today is going to be an important and powerful conversation. So I just want to acknowledge you guys for taking the time to be on here. You know, I think one of the beautiful things about uh, being part of One Life during all of these crises, you know, that have been stacked on top of each other, is that. Um, you're surrounded with people who are are investing in themselves and, and wanting to be part of the solution. So uh, I just want to acknowledge you. Um, you know, Tim made a post in the One Life uh, Roadmap community, our, our Facebook group, and he asked uh, to post a song, um, you know, that, that kind of speaks to our, our mind at the moment. And the one that came up for me was uh, The Man in the Mirror by uh, you know, the pop legend Michael Jackson. And, and uh, I think that that's a big thing that a lot of people are doing right now is looking at themselves and, and you know, how are they a part of either you know the problem or, or, or being a part of the solution. So um, I want to thank you guys. And, and One Life over the last year has gone into you know, probation centers and juvenile detention centers and, and prisons and, and schools in some of these cities to, um, frankly, I, I think uh, to, to prevent some of these things that are, that are happening right now. You know, a lot of the um, things that we work on in our roadmap experiences are you know, emotional intelligence and working with others and, and, and you know, relationships, the big part of our core four. And so I think that today's conversation is just really fitting. And also the timing of it, you know, we had been working on something for uh, several months, the, the One Life Roadmap Journal. Um, we, we have one for students that's been out for a year or so, but we have uh, one coming out next week that's actually for adults. And it's just, you know, and maybe it's the universe's timing. I don't, you know, maybe it's, it's irony, but um, I think that there, there couldn't be a better tool for people um, who are, are looking to either get their life on track or, or to take, you know, their life to the next level. And so um, all those cool things are happening. I just want to thank you guys for being uh, a part of, of those things. Um, I mentioned that, that people are looking for ways to get involved. And, and we've been talking a lot about, you know, personally, how can you grow? Um, how can you grow your business? That's been a, a topic of these calls. And, and today, I think that we're going to talk about, you know, societally or, or you know, within your, within your community, what sort of things um, should you be thinking about? How can you be growing? And, and more importantly, how can you get involved? And so um, we brought uh, two people that I couldn't think of that are, are more on the forefront of these. Um, Christopher Lockhead is our, our first guest. And I think that, you know, when I was thinking about what he does, he's, he's a lightning rod for change. And he's a, a Silicon Valley legend. He's written, you know, a bunch of books. He's a top 100 podcast host. And what I think, you know, people, when, when he talks, people listen. And I, I was thinking about why that is. And I think it's just because he is he says what everybody wishes they had the the cojones to say and he says it and uh and and i think that he does it in a way that people can understand and so um we're gonna obviously you know get into a lot about uh you know that perspective and then uh, our other guest today is denarius lewis and before the recording started we talked a little about denarius's background uh he's he's been on the front lines of of this movement for quite some time you know a lot of people think that this is popping up you know in the last several weeks but um, the Black Lives Movement and, and you know, this whole, yeah, this whole thing has been bubbling for, for years and people have been mobilizing and organizing and strategizing for, for years, you know, uh, behind the scenes. And so now over the last several weeks, people have really uh, woken up to, you know, to the work that they've been doing. And so he's a Minneapolis native. He's written a book called The Essence of Inspiration. Uh, we mentioned that he, he spoke here uh, at the One Life Conference here in, in Long Beach this past year. And so um, I think that a, a good way, I'm going to turn it over right now. I'm done talking. I had, an, uh, I had some notes here uh, that I wanted to get down, but I'm done. And we're going to throw it over to Daenerys and Christopher. And Daenerys, I think um, a great thing for you to do would just be to kick it off um, and talk about what you guys have been doing, what, where you guys are at, you know, give, us, um, give us some perspective from the ground floor. And then Christopher, you, know, you can feel free to take over and respond or ask questions and you know, uh, see it where, you know, wherever you see fit. So Daenerys, why don't you why don't you take it over and, and give us a little insight on what's been going on? Perfect. Can you guys hear me perfectly? Yes. Perfect. So again, my name is Daenerys Lewis. I'm a local. I mean, um, it's protest restaurants, businesses, grocery stores are all boarded. Um, you know, we have we have a lot of in the inner cities that are already struggling with resources. Our resources are now gone or obsolete mm. uh, because of the looting and the rioting. Um, so we have a lot of community donation, food donation um, events that are happening. We've been raising funds, supplies. Uh, we have, we're also right now doing a concert um, just to give uh, a, a give remembrance towards George Floyd and uh, a lot of community conversation around this 
around this conversation that we're still having around race. Uh, there's only one race, which is human race, but you know, we have, again, a certain size treating others in the sense of the oppression, whether that's connected to the laws, to the policies, and um, we also, so again, my background, I, I, I created an organization called Pose with a Cop. So I've been working with the Brooklyn Center Police Department for the five, for the, for the past five years. So I've been working along police departments. I've been a part of hiring panels, uh, working on some alongside um, policing, uh, bringing, having shop with a cop, uh, coffee with a cop, ice cream with a cop, different ways that the community can build a connection uh, with policing. As we all know, there's a big disconnect. And when we have this disconnect, is the reason why we're having this conversation today around protests, around community, around the disconnect that we continue, in, the disconnect and the divide that we continue to have a conversation around. This is no different than the 60s and 70s. We're just having it now with um, the access of technology that's showing to light what, how people are being treated. So uh, there's a lot been happening in Minneapolis. Uh, we're, one thing I've, I've learned is that we're a really tight niche con community. A lot of people, you know, times like this, we could have, pointed fingers at the right versus left, politics, but people from all walks of life have come together in Minneapolis and Minnesota as a whole and really have um, come out and donated thousands and thousands of pounds of food, clothes, and given housing to people who have also lost housing due to some of the, the looting and rioting. Huge. Christopher, you have thoughts? I mean, you have a... a direction you want to take it in, in terms of talking about the status of where we're at and kind of what you think? Yeah. And I, I just, let me say off the top, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with all of my friends, my sisters and brothers at One Life. Uh, um, Denarius, it's great to be with you as well. And I really thank all of you for this time. Um, yesterday was a very difficult day here in Santa Cruz, California. Yesterday at six o'clock, over 500 people paddled out for George Floyd. And a paddle out is a way that surfers uh, have a, a, a funeral and mourn and celebrate life together in the water. They, they get to a certain place in the water and they form a big circle. And, um, and so at six o'clock yesterday, hundreds of us of almost every race chanted together, Black Lives Matter, mm. cried together, screamed George Floyd's name, screamed no justice, no peace. And uh, the rally in the water, the paddle out, was led by young people. And the woman doing the call outs on the megaphone was a young blonde white woman. And we all have space of whatever race to yell Black Lives Matter and to demand justice for George and to demand equality and demand an end to police brutality and to police reform. So that was one of the things we did yesterday in Santa Cruz. Before that, at 2.26 in the afternoon, again, many hundreds of us were together at the headquarters of the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department. Because on Saturday, Sergeant Damon Gertzweiler was murdered in the line of duty. You see a maniac hell bent on killing police with automatic weapons and homemade explosive devices killed Damon because he and his partner were the first two to respond. Other police were injured. Damon, like George, was the family man and leaves a destroyed, distraught family. Damon has a young child and a wife and his wife is pregnant. So yesterday in Santa Cruz, we cried for two fallen heroes. And there's a number of things I want to share with you today. But the big one is this.
there is no black, white, brown, or blue. There are many in our country right now who are trying to divide us. To those people, I say, fuck you. Legends unite. And you can celebrate and you can cry for a man who was brutally murdered by evil police. And you can celebrate and cry a man who was a sergeant in the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department who died serving our community, who gave his life so that this maniac wasn't able to kill more of us. And I say that not only are those two things not mutually ex exclusive, they are the same. They are a stand against injustice. We can stand with the many, the overwhelming number of good cops. And we can stand with our African-American friends and brothers and sisters and demand justice and demand equality and demand reform. And those two things are the same. And the reason they're the same is because even though people of many different colors were together yesterday, everybody cries colorless tears. And the one other thing I'll say to you off the top, I'm gonna to share something that I have um, never really spoken about um, with one exception. On October 1st last year, one of my best friends, a man I consider a brother, was attacked at 3 a.m. in his home and murdered by three people, attacked, kidnapped, and murdered. For 231 days, the women and men of the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department worked tirelessly to bring this evil to justice. My brother was a brown guy, those are his words, of Indian descent. The four evil that killed him were white. I could tell you because I have had a front row seat to a massive, complex, multi-agency murder investigation. Sheriff Jim Hart and the legendary public servants at the, can at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department and the Santa Cruz County DA's office are far from racist. They stand for justice. When the Obama administration over five years ago now put together new regulations on policing to get in front of this problem, Sheriff Jim Hart adopted those policies, adopted new training policies. And over 231 days, not only did we not see racism, we saw deep commitment to justice. Those peacekeepers and public servants cried with us and they didn't give a shit that my brother was brown and that his killers were white. So yesterday we all cried tears. And I say that we can stand for justice, we can stand for peace and we can stand for reform and we can stand for Black Lives Matter and we can stand for good cops. And all of that is standing for the same thing. Because as far as I'm concerned, this is a conversation about good and evil. Daenerys, I'd love to throw it back to you and, and talk about, you know, what what are the solutions? I think a big, a big challenge is that um, People are in, are in a, a few places that I've seen. Uh, Tim mentioned before the call that he didn't, he didn't wanna, wanna do the Drew Brees 
and I, and I think that there's so many out there that are, um, uh, are getting, frankly, they're getting railroaded, um, as some rightly so, but, but there's just, some people don't know what to do. And, and a big thing is that they don't know what to do. And, and so, uh, the safest and maybe not safest thing now is to, you know, was, was doing nothing, but I think that we're past that point. And so what are, what are some of the solutions both on a personal level that someone can, can do, whether it's changing their mindset or their thought process, and then systematically, what are some of the solutions that people are talking about? Um, you know, and what are some of the actual reform? You know, everyone wants to say, let's reform, but uh, can you talk about what some of that reform might look like or, you know, what, what some of those things, um, how, how those are happening right now on the ground? Yeah, so um, this, to tackle it at, at a personal level, it is the conversations that we're having with our, with our peers, our friends, our family, and our loved ones. So this conversation, that, like you, as you just stated, this conversation sometimes gets pushed off, the, and this is now a dinner, table, ta a dinner table conversation. This is a conversation that you should have with your kids. Um, as I'm going out, and I've been at the, at the protest daily, uh, I see families of all walks of, from all walks, uh, shame tones, cultures, ethnicities, ages, and it's a very humbling experience where, uh, because we're now at a time where we're hearing stories that are relatable. Uh, the stories that I hear as I'm listening to uh, the, the family of George Floyd, listening to the mother of Eric Gardner, uh, listening to the mother of Trayvon Martin, all the different mothers, uh, it reminds me of my own mother. Um, I'm a, I come from a single parent household, I'm the only boy, and I get, I have to remind myself that the things that I'm fighting to, you know, fighting for or standing up against or the injustice that, or the conversations that we're having, this is, it's a conversation that also brings fear uh, because again, I, I, I match the description of an unarmed person of color um, in, the, in this life. But the, convers the way we have this conversation is again with love, compassion, and being able to hear uh, the other person's perspective. Right now, one thing that we have learned, one, well, to be very frank, in the world of activism, black people, we are always having our stories being told by Caucasians. That's just been the thing, the history. If we go down the, the route of us growing up in school, we only hear about the, the Malcolm X's, the Martin Luther King's, but there's a lot more people outside of the, the, the two that, we're, that we're, we're brought to know. It's because our story isn't our stories aren't being told by ourselves. Our stories aren't being told by our people, and the outcries that we're continuing to told being being that's being told is no different than that's being said from history after history after history, which is the police brutality, um, us fighting for equal rights, us fighting to have our voices being heard, us fighting to even um, still be you know equal. Uh, this is a conversation that is that my mom had when she was born in the 60s, uh, when she was marching in the 70s. This is a conversation I'm having um, in the in the 2020s. And uh, one thing I was talking to a friend recently was that we can't enact and we can't write into laws people to not be racist. Racism is something that is embedded in the history, white supremacy. Um, culture, heritage, Southern pride, whatever a person may have an excuse, but it's, it's taught behavior. I have a friend, um, she, is, uh, she is, she is, she's Caucasian, she has a biracial um, daughter. She, she is, she's Caucasian, she has a, bi a biracial daughter and her father, um, she has sides of the family that tell her to wash the, 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 the black off her. Or I have another friend who's Asian, and her 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 um, her boyfriend is Caucasian. He's told his daughter to wipe wipe the Asian off of her. And so these are taught behaviors and conversations that, if you're telling your four year old daughter that the Asians do not accept her Asian side, she's going to grow up with a problem, uh, an insecurity. And a lot of the conversations I'm having with these single parent mothers. Uh, people on the front line protest and attack. They, they they have a story that they have that they're not that's not being heard. And so right now, what you're seeing with the outcry internationally is black and indigenous voices finally being heard. Um, and people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, at a 
at a, at a very local and a very personal level. It's the conversations that we have with our friends, our loved ones. It's us going out and finding in our, in our community in what ways that we can contribute. Can we contribute financially? And if we aren't able to contribute financially to an organization, a nonprofit, or, or, or even sponsoring and helping individuals, you are able to volunteer your time to organizations that reflect the values that you have, whether that's staying, staying in, in marching or uh, supporting Black Lives Matter or, or, or Indigenous Lives Matter or whatever, whatever the case may be. There's ways to do it at a very local level. Uh, back in 2015, I saw the Trayvon Martin situation, the Mike Brown was what really enacted me. And so I started the March for the Black Lives Matter movement in 2015 and 2016. And as I continued to build those, those personal connections, I kept showing up to the protests. The more times you show up to these events, you start to meet the people that you need to know that you're, that's gonna educate you, that's gonna point you in the right direction of what civil duty that you would want to uh, give back to within your community. And as I started to build those networks, I started to get the invite to uh, really be not only in the front line, but understand and behind the scenes of how these things are, how these things actually change laws. So for us to have a disrupt, to, to dis for us to disrupt society with a protest, with a riot or whatever those cases may be, at times those really aren't the necessary ways to do it, but it's to it start, it spark, it spark the conversation. It took, it took a woman to sit in front of a bus to have a conversation about equality of using the same drinking fountains. So when we point the figures of what, why, how we should do things differently, uh, it's all, sometimes history is done in such an abrupt, abrupt of manner. Uh, where I see this going with laws, right now we have Minnesota and, and Minneapolis, uh, they have the city of Minneapolis, a lot of organizations have defunded and taken them, taken, their names uh, and their business uh, elsewhere in interacting with the Minneapolis Police Department. We have the University of Minnesota, uh, any contracts, business after business is starting to, because if you're really gonna enact change, change starts economically. And that's why you see a lot of people uh, when it comes to a Me Too movement or any movement where it comes to corporate, corporate dollar or corporate corruption, people take their protests with their money because that's where it really hits anyone as a whole. So uh, we have Minneapolis losing a lot of partnerships. Uh, we have, which is a, which is a way to, to really enact change and the change, how that enacted change was, we really wanted ways for the community to be funded by, for the, the, for the community to be funded. So we have a lot of money going to police departments and there's ways where you can, that, that money that's going to the police department can be spread out for the community as well. If $150 million is going into a police department, which I don't say, I'm not saying a police department doesn't deserve to have that, uh, that type of dollar sign. I work with cops, I'm, I'm on the power board, a lot of my friends are cops. Uh, but I'll say this in a sense because I had a friend that was telling me, uh, he's, out, he's, out he's out protecting people in the protest. His name, he's getting called every name in the book. He's Caucasian and his family has been threatening and he's telling a story. She's telling this story very authentically. She's crying. She's, it's her niece and her nephew. And I'm a very, you know, sensible person. And I'm just thinking in the back of my mind, you know, he's a police officer. He's feeling threats for his life. He, you know, he's going through all these, these this, this, you know, this protest and stuff. And I thought to myself, I was like, well, if he's feeling threatened for his life, can't he just quit his job? Can't he quit his job and just be something else? Because as a person of color, as a, as a uh, Hispanic, as a black person, I can't change being black. I can't change the experiences that I'm gonna experience being black. Um, I have a lot of people that have given, that's come to me to have this conversation and I didn't wanna speak on it because it's a conversation that I'm having naturally. Um, another black person being killed by the injustice. We can watch a video for how the, what, for what it is in the, and then it come out completely different, being changed by the media and all these different fear mongering ways. So it hit me home, it, it hit hard. And I went to every protest and I've cried every day last week. And I had to take myself away from the protest and do a lot of self care and self love this past, this past week and now it's Monday. Um, and it's just a reality check where we're still having this conversation. This is a conversation where um, as a person of color, I, I have my permit to carry, and I work with police departments, I can dress nice, I can be at the desk character, I can write all books, I can be all the success in the world. 
But one day that I choose not to wear a suit, I, I can just wear my leisure clothes, I, I blend in. And again, we're, we're judged for our skin tone before we're judged for our accomplishments and our character. And that's one of the things I've had to learn as a shifting person, as an entrepreneur, of knowing which pocket can I be myself. We hear terms that people of color have had to learn, which is called code switching. When we're in a code, code switching is when we're in, a, in an environment that we don't feel that it's an environment for us. So it's, it's code switching to fit in, to be a carnelian, and to have those conversations. And we all do it in, in, in a facet, but some but people of color and minorities do code switching in a sense of survival. We have to code switch to survive this world that was not built for us. We have to survive in a world where laws weren't built for us. We may have built the system, we may have built the system, built the White House, built the building, built all the all the different railroads, but we weren't the, it wasn't built for us to use. And we've been fighting time after time to have access to these these natural freedoms that have been written into law for others, but not for everyone. So when we talk about this conversation around race, writing, and where we go as a community and as a whole, it's how we really interact with each other. It's how we, it's with love, compassion. Um, I don't care what color tone you are, if you're white or black, if you're voted for Trump, whatever it may be, if we can interact and find common ground, then we're finding common ground as humans. And right now, I feel in time, we're, we're, we're really at a time where people have not stayed people are not have been educated on how to interact with each other we're, we we we've lost we we again we're de we're dehumanizing people um lives are being lost dramatically and uh you know i'm a i someday want to have a kid and this is a conversation i'm going to have to have with my son when i was nine years old i had the conversation with my mom on how to navigate in a very cocky in a very white world I, I, not to, how to date inside my race this is something that is that's never ending. We can't end racism, but how we enact it into laws is we want police departments to have better training. We want police departments to have better mental assessments. We want police departments to have better social awareness towards the communities that they serve. Uh, emotional intelligence is, is a big component. Um, I'm a PCA. I work with vulnerable adults, people who have mental health disabilities, schizophrenia. The emotions are can, one moment they could be happy, the next moment they could kill you. And one thing I've had to do in my past is how to de-escalate my client from having a mental breakdown where it would impede my, my, my danger and a danger of others. And again, this, these are environments that I've had to walk in. And I could have had the best day being a speaker and I go into work and I'm now you know, the bad guy. And I have been on you know, ride alongs with cops. I have been on calls with cops. And it's a very, very stressful job. It's, the most, it's a very stressful job. But the job that it, for the person it takes to be a police officer, there has to be what we're doing, what we're advocating for is different ways and different laws and different requirements um, and different assessments. So we can go on and on with this conversation, but it really is uh, enacting those laws within those police departments, enacting the laws at the local level and then at the federal level as well. And right now it, we're having a, at Minneapolis as a whole, we've had some success. I mean, um, the city of Minneapolis has uh, taken severed ties with the Minneapolis Police Department alongside a lot of different organizations. We've had them just recently um, enact the law where uh, they have banned chokeholds. So Minneapolis Police Department can't chokehold or put their knee behind someone's back. Um, they just defunded the police department as well. We, the count, we're, we're really seeing a social change because the world is watching. And so I see Minneapolis as, a, as, as the starting point of states jumping along board and changing the laws at a local level for it to impact at a, at a federal level. And when, I, and when I went on the front line continuously, seeing the faces, hearing the mother's calls, and it, it brought me, and it rewoke me up. Um, I actually stopped doing social media from June, January or, uh, until, until now, really just to take some time for myself, rebuild my business. But this, this really refocused, this really revitalized my, 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 my passion towards this conversation um, because sometimes we want to push it off. It's an uncomfortable. And I like to talk about the uncomfortability of the, of the conversation. So I don't judge a person for their skin tone. It's never been my, my, my ordeal. And the conversation that we want to have as a whole that we're having right now is where do we go from here? Well, we're, what we're doing right now is 
what needs to be done, having a conversation, bringing people on, and having an open dialogue of really having people, everyone has a story of being, of being many people who of color have a story. They've had an experience, whether it's a, a story of how someone spoke to them uncomfortably, whether it's a microaggression, whether it's them having to code switch to get a job, whatever the situation may be, we've had to navigate our, way, our lives in a very all white space. And it's our time to have our stories being told. And it's our time to finally come together as a whole and stop being, pulling the fingers at right, right versus left, the separate white, you know, white versus black. Um, because we're in this, we're in this together, and if we're really going to interact on this one planet that we are, we're solely given, we have to find ways to get along with each other, no matter what skin tone that we have, ethnicity, culture, and language. And I, I'll, I'll stop. So, so Denarius, I, I, I'd love to share something with you and maybe get your reaction. Um, one of the things that feels different since the murder of George Floyd to me is uh, I feel included yeah. in a way that I did not before. It was an extraordinary thing to sit yesterday in a circle with so many people, many of whom were not black or brown, screaming at the top of our lungs, Black Lives Matter. And I think before George Floyd was killed, I would have felt uncomfortable screaming that. I think before George, George Floyd was murdered, uh, I would have felt uncomfortable wearing a Black Lives t-shirt. And now I feel included. And it's a very, very powerful thing to see white people with signs that say Black Lives Matter. So many of them, tens of thousands of them standing up. And so I think the powerful thing this time is this notion there is no us and them. This is not about black. And yes, it's targeted at black people. So I, I'm not being stupid. But what it's really about is, in my mind, to the point you made earlier, Denarius, this is about the future of our choosing. See, one of the things that drives me nuts is people talk about the future like they talk about the weather forecast, right? Oh, on Tuesday in Santa Cruz, we're forecasting a high of 76 and fog in the morning and da-da-da-da-da. As though the future's just going to be whatever it's going to be. Well, it's not. The future is how we design it. And so what I'd love to get your reaction to is this experience that I personally have had of being included in this in a way that I didn't feel before. And I don't mean that critically. It's just how I feel. It, 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 hit, it feels like it hit a tipping point where um, I was able to be part of it in a way that I didn't feel like I was before. And maybe that's my own dumb fault. I'll accept that. Um, but all that said, how would you like to see us come together and be unified against evil and racism in a way that we weren't before? And um, to piggyback, I, I, I agree with you. I, I definitely have seen the conversation of so many people wanting to have, saying that they feel included with this one. I'm having conversations with people I would necessarily never have guessed they wanted to have this conversation. And I would say we've seen a lot of these videos come out, a lot of these questions, um, and the, the, the narrative will always sometimes change. Well, what's the, what's, the, what's the full video? What happened? Oh, he did this. He was doing this. Um, he, and in this case, it was really cut blatant. Like, you see it. It's nine minutes. He's asking, hey, can you please get your neck, you know, I can't breathe, and and I mean I cry every time I hear it. Like the, the when I'm going to the protest, uh, because you know he's screaming mama, and he's a grown adult. When a grown man screams mother, and his mother is deceased, he's 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 screaming for help. And one thing I've learned is that many people, we've all have screamed for a mom. It's something that we've all, everyone, every gender, every race, every culture, have screamed for their mother and help. And 
the pain and the emotions that we, that if you watch that video. That I hate video, to interrupt you, Denarius, but if you met so, my mom, I'm not sure you would, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, so everyone's different. She, different she's going to kill like, me for that one. <laughs> yeah, I have no problem with that. My, you know, my mom, I have some stories too. But in, in that sense, we screamed help for that. And so it was, it's a very emotional connection. And um, every life that has been black that has lost previously, we have always wanted our white allies to be at the table in the front force with us. We can't do it alone because it's typically the angry black woman, they typically, typically the angry black story of an angry person saying something and having it fall on deaf ears. So now you're seeing a collective of people hearing those, those ears now is falling on them. Everyone that necessarily that's hearing it doesn't look like us. And they're now telling our stories. They're, they're being a part of the message. They're being a part of the conversation. And we want it because change doesn't just happen on one side. Change happens with everyone as a, as a collective. So because the voices and the things that we want to write into law that will empower and inclu include us all, it's not us that are, that's going to write it into law. And when I when I buy us, I mean uh, people of color. It's our ally. It's the people who are on the that are in politics that don't, don't necessarily look like them. That we're coming to them to present them with things that we need to be done in our community. And we need our allies. We need our we need our conversation with our, with people who don't look like us, but people who can have that conversation. Let's say. Prime example, you're related to someone in, 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 a, in a government, at a local you know, office, and you're, we can have an authentic conversation, but he has a string hole of his opinion. Just because he respects you, Christopher, he's willing to have a conversation with you to open up that dialogue that he once was closed off on. So yes. well, I'm, I'm saying all that because it really starts with our relationships with our family members, our relationship with our friends, or it's, a, it's a conversation that has to continue to happen. Um, and the only way we, re, we, we tweak it is us giving an open invite uh, from everyone from all walks because this isn't a right versus black. It's, this is, it's, it's, it's a human issue. It's a human crisis. It's a human crisis. We can't continue to treat people differently because of their ethnicity, their, their, their poverty, their education. The list goes on and on. And that's where we, and when people start to do that, which is what unfortunately this, the why we're having this conversation, it it, it becomes a, an equal and uh, an imbalance of power, and we're all here together. We, there's an ecosystem. We need we need this person to work this job for this for the business funnel. It's a, there's an ecosystem in society, and right now the, the disconnect is in the public servant where we all there's a lot of conversation with the part. The, go, go right ahead. And let me ask you this. I, I think another thing that may be tipping here, um, to the best of my knowledge, there's nobody in my circle of friends that I'm close to who is Caucasian, who is racist in any way, because if they were, they wouldn't be my friends. So that's sort of point A. Point B, there, we all have um, sort of biases that hide underneath the surfaces that we may not realize. Um, and so I think there's a couple things going on. Number one, we're all being challenged to look at our behavior over, over years and ask ourselves some tough questions around, were we biased in ways that we didn't realize? And I'll give you a simple example. When my brother was murdered, and they captured the four evil fucks who did it. They're young. The youngest is 19, and the oldest is 23. There were people who said things like, they don't look like criminals. People on fucking Facebook said, they don't look like criminals. To which I respond, what do criminals look like? Because they look like psychopathic murderers to me. And when you say that these four white evil fucks don't look like criminals, you're being racist. And the number of people who lost their shit with me when I said that to them would knock you over arguing with me that I was being an asshole or I was this or I was that, or that I was wrong. And so I think what this is giving us 
is it is it it's forcing and i use that word on purpose us to look at things in a very precise way they don't look like criminals there was a local media television reporter who posted their pictures and says uh faces of criminals question mark and i responded to him and i said well Maybe I'm overly sensitive. I'm sure I am. What do you mean faces of criminals, question mark? What are the fucking faces of criminals? And whether you realize it or not, that is a racist statement. And you might not be a racist, but you just made a racist statement. And by the way, I'm sure I've said things like that in my past. So I'm not trying to be holier than thou. What I am trying to say is there are subtle things that we now have to pay attention to that could cause harm. And things along those lines do cause harm. So that's the first one. The, the second problem I think we have, Denarius, and this is really where I'd love some insight from you. Uh, years ago, I served for, for quite a few years on the advisory board to the World Wildlife Foundation, a wonderful, wonderful uh, nonprofit that's been around for a long time. And as a guy who's you know, spent the vast majority of my professional career in marketing, uh, of course, I wanted to help them uh, market and raise money and, and awareness and the like. And the big problem that became clear for the World Wildlife Fund at the time was we were really good at marketing to people who quote unquote got it. People were already believed that uh, conservation matters and animals matter, the environment matters, and that we need to take action to protect species the best we can and so forth. What we were not good at is convincing people who didn't get it, who didn't think it was important, or who didn't actually think that the mass extinction going on in the planet right now is any kind of a problem and that human beings should do anything to deal with it. And so here's my problem as a white guy. I'm not fr friends with anybody who's, who's overtly racist because if they were, they wouldn't be my friends. We can do a better job of managing ourselves and being more critical of ourselves so we don't allow people to say things like they don't look like killers just because they're fucking young and white. We can do that. But what do we do with not only the people who don't get it, but the people who actually are racist, what do we do? What do I do with the people who think that people of color are less than them? How do we market to those people? What do we do with those people? That's a, um, a very, that's a very beautiful question. And the only way we can fight racism is continued education and experience. So a lot of the stories that are, a lot of the times when a racist person is saying certain things, they, met, they don't have any basis on it. They never even met a person who's actually a person of color who's done that. They're hearing it from another person's perspective or taught, taught racist behavior. So it's conversation and experience. Bring them around a person that, 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 because if they if they ever if if one has a perspective of people of color of being well fared, uh, child you know they have baby daddies all whatever stereotype, again stereotypes going all different, you bring them around uh, and get them experience around people that necessarily look doesn't look like them and it just it's it's a it's really experience and at times you can't get people out of their comfort zone but you can't you can't lead a horse to water you can't you can't force something like that. It's just a, it's a conversation and how do we bring it? We, I mean, in a, in a funny way, we, we dismantle Fox news. I mean, <laughs> I'm, there, it's, it's misinformation that continues to have rhetoric that continues this cycle of supremacy towards racism, towards treating another, towards uh, building the wall. Uh, they're all rapists. They're all this. And it's, it's, it's rhetoric, it's fear-mongering, it's a conversation. We have to continue to fight 
um, falsehoods and opinions with facts and experiences and stories. So if, if a person has a problem with, if, if a person says all oh, Mexicans are rapists and killers and all that, you, you bring a person to the table who is a- Yeah, but they on- sure make great fucking food and I love tequila and I love the music. What are you talking about? Are you Literally, out of your fucking mind? And oh, by the way, black people are the coolest people in the fucking country. Why is it that, that white kids wear the sneakers that black athletes and the music and the cult, like, what are we fucking talking about? So let me ask you this. And I've done this historically over time. And over the last six months or so, I've taken it to another level. And that is, I will call out those reporters for saying those things. I will deal with the absolute fuck, re fucking moron assholes in social media who want to argue with me when they say, when they say, oh, they, they just threw their lives away. They just, they, they're so young and they threw their lives away. Really? They fucking took my brother's life and you're talking about their life? You fucking insane moron? Fuck you. And when, and when you want to talk about, you know, I hear this too with this fucking cop that's being arraigned, I think today or this week. Oh, he threw his life away. Fuck you. We're not talking about him. We're talking about George Floyd, you idiot. And so I I guess my point is uh, there's a lot of fighter in me. For whatever reason, Daenerys, anger is my happy place. And I've tried really hard to channel that anger in good ways. For the record, I haven't been in a fist fight since I was 10 or 11. Um. But I guess here's my question. I have been taking a more aggressive stance when I see this shit. I just tell people what's up. And if they push back hard, you know, and this may make me a bad person, I just tell them to go fuck themselves and grow an IQ. You had as much choice about where and to whom you were born as I did. And that's true for all of us. And so to me, you're an absolute moron because there but for the grace of God, nobody on this call was born in Syria. Because if you were born in Syria, life really fucking sucks right now, right? So we had no choice to whom and to where and what color of our skin, et cetera, we were born into. And so thinking that you're better because you're something that others are not, to me, is insane. And I have just, frankly, I've gotten more militant with people about this. I just have. And so I guess my question to you is, do you believe if more of us who are not of color stand up for and, frankly, fight with I don't mean physically, I mean verbally. I don't want to fight with them physically. Although sometimes I sure feel like it. Um, Other people who are Caucasian, when they say and do this stupid shit. Because here's here's the aha, and here's why I, I love what's going on right now. I didn't feel like I could wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, I do now. And it's one thing for black people to say that, And look, this may be a controversial statement. I think it's a whole other thing when tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, and, and, and probably now millions of people around the world who are not black say it. Because the difference we can make in influencing the behavior, in making it completely and totally socially unacceptable. We can write all the fucking laws that we want. But at a dinner party, when somebody says something horrible, if others don't say, hey, listen, Jimmy, that was a fucking racist statement. Grow an IQ. So I'd love your reaction to that, Denarius. Yeah, I I, I like that. And um, yeah, we have to check our friends. We have friends who say certain stuff that needs to be checked. And I've done that completely, uh, whether it's someone saying something about about a woman or person or uh, gender just you have we have to check people 
And um, where do we go from here? And I love, I'm getting to that point where you're, you're getting, you have a lot more years of um, age on me. So I'm getting to that point where I, I'm being unapologetically angry. Hey, you're not discriminating uh, against uh, the aged, are you? <laughs> no, not at all. This is not ageism. So. Who are you calling old, Denarius? <laughs> <laughs> you got some years on me. So I, your, your, your years of experience of uh, being angry can be justified. And because sometimes people are like, well, you've only, you're young, you don't have a, but it still affects me, it affects my future, it affects my kids' future, it affects me personally. So um, I'm getting to that point where I'm very, I'm becoming more unapologetically um, uh, angry and more un literally unapologetically black. Because you, you, you brought, we were born, into, were born into our families, we're born into our skin tones, and it is what it is. And, but some people want to feel that they're better than another and it's a whole different insecurity, emotional roller coaster for why a person needs to even feel that way. Um, well, and, and here's the stupid thing that I think we need to finally get to. Two things can be true at the same time. So my grandfather fought in World War II. He was Scottish. After the war, he married my grandmother and he was a working class guy. There were no, there were no factory jobs. It was decimated. And so he got an opportunity to work in a factory in Montreal, Canada, and he moved to Canada and away we went, right? So on one hand, I'm very proud of being Canadian and I'm very proud of being Scottish. And I think it's really funny when, you know, uh, Mike Myers in his Scottish accent says, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. And I love to celebrate Scottish, her Scottish heritage and wear a kilt and, uh, uh, and certainly drink a shit ton of scotch. And so I think it's fun to celebrate that heritage and I love to celebrate others. My Indian friends, my black friends, my Jewish friends, my Muslim friends. You know what? It's fun to go to Israel and to have them call you an honorary Jew. That's cool, right? Uh, it's fun, I don't know about you, I'm a big food guy. I think food is fucking fantastic. Right, uh, I've traveled over six million miles on a plane in my life. I've eaten food from almost everywhere you can imagine. Not everywhere, but almost everywhere. And uh, you know, when you go down to New Orleans and you eat Cajun food, and, you know, you go on and on. And so, my point in all of that is, and music, same thing. Uh, years ago, I went to Cuba. Holy shit, Cuban music. Holy shit. You know, every restaurant in Havana has a live band all the time. They open it like 10 a.m. and they shut it, I don't know, 3 a.m. And the whole time there's music. And so what's my point? It, it's fun to celebrate being Scottish and all that. And it's equally fun to dig Cuban music. And, and, and I don't understand why more people can't be part of celebrating your culture and celebrate their own culture. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. As a matter of fact, I assert that one increases the value and enjoyment of the other. Yeah, I, you, you're, you're, you're hitting it right on the nail, especially with music, like even with um, Old Town Road, the controversy behind that song, it was an African-American um, country, country singer, rapper. The world went crazy. He, he, he blew the charts to the country stars and, the country, the country star, like the country music billboards, took him off because his, because he wasn't, because he wasn't country. Even though, in the, for him to make it country, he had to get on Billy Ray. He had to reach out to Billy Ray Cyrus to get it back on the country star. So it, it, I say this in a sense of um, we we want to be equal. We don't want to be divided. But it, it's not it's not a, it's not up to you know us. It's up to our, our allies to be open. And the conversation that, you're, that we're having right now is the conversation we have to continue to have with those in those powers that continue to oppress. We have, we have you know, this conversation around oppression is, is the conversation we, we, the, is what we should have. How do we eliminate oppression in policy and as a, in policy of housing, redlining, redistributing? We, we, have, we have so much racism in the world that is embedded in the policies that keep people in poverty. The reason why we have ghettos the reason why we have rough, the rough side of those neighborhoods. 
the reason why we have schools that are underfunded, the reason why we have poverty is because we have under we have underfunded communities. Um, I, I I used to be homeless in my in my in my in my past, and as I overcome overcame that, I look at my community as a whole. That you know, Minnesota Minnesota has homelessness. California has a lot of homelessness. I, I love I love going out to LA, Santa Monica area. But there's homeless homelessness everywhere, and if we're ever going to tackle it's tackle is we have the money out there. We're just not, it's not being funded in this way. We have, we have, we have tax havens. We have ways that we can really empower our community. So Denarius, I, can, if it, I think you're on something. You consider yourself an entrepreneur, yes? Yes. How much does your entrepreneur uh, ship, your entrepreneurial drive, how much difference did that make in you going from homeless to where you are today? It was everything. I'm an ex wrestler. So my background is wrestling. And um, um, if you, you know, if you can look up, you can get up. And then that's the, you know, the Les Brown quote, but that really <laughs> is the same thing in wrestling. If you see the lights, you better get up. And um, when I look back at that time, it's where I'm at now. I know only 27. Um, it, 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 it's, 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 it's a, you have to, you have You're to getting old, Denarius, You're getting old. <laughs> And here's the thing, here's the thing. So my birthday is May 25th. May 25th is the day that George Floyd was, was killed. So for the anniversary of George Floyd's death, I'll, it'll, it's going to be the same day of my birthday. So this is something I'm going to have to live with until the day I pass away. So this is something that I'm carrying because as I was celebrating life, I was all, we were also, you know, celebrating the life of that same moment. And I, I say all that in, in a sense because um, the life that we, we envision. I have not met a person in my life that wants to grow up broke, unhealthy, fat, sluggish, poor. That's not the commonality. The commonality that we're going to find in every single person in the walks of life that they want to be happy, they want to be loved, they want to be appreciated. They want it's a feeling, and it's, it's an emotion. So really, in life, we're really chasing emotion. We're we're chasing something that's inner, because as any person that's been successful or has had a certain success, you can get a house, you can get a car. That feeling lasts for so long. And you're looking for that next feeling. And that's why like, I always get back to like, the feeling of, you know, as an entrepreneur, what drove me to want to be successful was I wanted to feel what, what I was lacking, being loved, being appreciated. I wanted to make my mom proud. I wanted to, make, I wanted to prove it to the world that this college dropout could make it or whatever the case may be. And I say that to anyone, we're in this world of fighting racism, we're chasing a feeling. And what would that feel like? feeling appreciated, feeling loved, feeling that I can walk into the store not being followed because of the skin tone um, or the way that I dress. And <laughs> what and, about the feeling like I have an opportunity? And that's So the you and I are way more alike than we are different. Correct. I'm the product of a single mother. We grew up with very little. I had a paper route when I was 10 or 11 years old and I had it to the time I was about 16 or 17 years old. I got thrown out of school at 18 for being stupid. Found out 21, I wasn't so stupid. I have dyslexia and dyscalculia and a bunch of these learning differences. I roll them all together. I call them dysfuglia. <laughs> uh, and at 18, the choices I had were a life of manual labor and struggle or start a company. And so for many of us, entrepreneurship is not a way up. And if it is, that's fine. It's great. But it is a way out of a life of poverty and a life of struggle. You went from being homeless to being a successful entrepreneur. And that is the story, your story and my story around entrepreneurship is the story of many, many entrepreneurs. And here's a conversation I think is horribly missing right now. We are at the lowest level of recorded entrepreneurship in American history, according to the Brookings Institute. And four years ago, the uh, Wall Street Journal declared a crisis in American entrepreneurship. There are many reasons why that is the case, and we can get into them if you want. I've done my homework. But here's the thing that's not getting talked about right now. Entrepreneurship is a way out. Why the fuck are we not talking more about what one life fully lived has been on for a very long time? Uh, there's people in the chat talking about 
our friend and, and somebody I think almost all of us, if not all of us, look up to deeply, Jeff Hoffman. All of these people who are trying to make a difference by making it more possible for uh, the underserved, the forgotten, the written off to become entrepreneurs, to get rid of the injustice and the bullshit that stands in the way of entrepreneurship in our inner cities. And so I don't understand why in the midst of all of this, in the midst of an election year, when virtually, if you look at the data, and I have, virtually all of the job growth comes from entrepreneurs. A, a disproportionate number of the new innovation as measured by patents to the US Patent Office comes from small and new and growing companies. And if we have more entrepreneurs of color, if we have more entrepreneurs who go from homeless to successful, who go from paper boys to successful, we will have a different kind of equality because I was listening. I'm a huge martial arts fan. You talk about being a wrestler. I love wrestlers. And uh, one of my favorite martial artists is a wrestler. His name is Daniel Cormier. He's originally from uh, Louisiana. Do you know him, Denarius? Have you heard yes, of him? Sir. Yeah, I went, to, I went to school with John Bones Jones. <laughs> well, you know, John doesn't behave very well, but that's a whole other conversation. No, he <laughs> he's an incredible talent, but he's, he's got a billion dollar talent and unfortunately a 10 cent head, but that's a whole other conversation. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, unlike that, however, is uh, Daniel Cormier. Um, and he made an interesting comment uh, on a, a martial arts uh, podcast recently. He said, you know what? People are on their best behavior when they're around me because they know I'm the champion. Michael Jordan, these are, these are his words, not mine. Michael Jordan doesn't face that much racism because everybody's real happy to see Michael. And what it made me think of is when people are successful, they're viewed much differently, right? Yeah. Uh, people today call me eccentric, call me different and unique. Well, if I wasn't a successful entrepreneur and marketer, they would call me nuts. Right. <laughs> That's the difference between being eccentric and insane is that you're viewed as successful. And yeah. so the aha for me in all of this, and it's been on my mind for years, but it's, it's like in my face, where the fuck is the conversation about entrepreneurship? Where is the conversation that Tim Rode and Jeff Hoffman and so many other of us associated with this extraordinary organization we deeply love, one life fully live, have been so focused on, which is helping people dream, plan, and live their best life, and either becoming an entrepreneur, or even if you're not technically an entrepreneur, being entrepreneurial, taking responsibility for your future, and including your financial future, and trying to empower yourself. And if you're lucky enough to be successful, one of my favorite expressions is, if you get to the top of a mountain, throw down the fucking rope, right? Many of us are trying to throw down that fucking rope. And so I guess my point in all of this, Denarius, is where is the conversation about creating the future, about agency, and specifically what we need to do collectively to help spark a breakthrough of massive proportions in entrepreneurship in our communities of color? That conversation is really is actually really happening um, at a local level. It's not. It has to be. Hap it has to be. Ha it has to happen at a federal, at a, at a national, federal level. It needs to be embedded into our schools. We were. You, you'll never like. We I, I I. We graduate high school and we still grow up and we still don't know how to do taxes. We go to school and we don't know how to manage money. Like financial literacy is the is the key. And again, generational poverty is. So my, my story, again, I overcame generational poverty. And what I learned by that was uh, at 23 years old, I had to file chapter seven bankruptcy, put myself in a lot of debt and try to make it go to college, do that, that left school to be an entrepreneur. And to, when I went, I went to call my mom for some advice, because you call people that you know for advice, I found out my mom had filed bankruptcy two months prior. Well, look, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And at that moment, I had to rewrite who I hung out with. So I started to ask questions to the people that I sat at the table with at the, at the country club, 
uh, the, the country clubs that I spoke at as a speaker, I would are are the um, the networking events, all the uh, the chains of commerce. I started to network and ask questions to to these financial advisors. Now I have a financial advisor over at Merrill Lynch. I, I've been through the years of having the conversations. I grew my credit score from over a four to over seven hundred. I was able to. I'm the first generational um, homeowner, first generational entrepreneur, author. I, I, I'm twenty. I, I bought my first home at twenty six. I'm the first person in my entire family like. I say all that because the history that we- Hey, Demarius, could you get on with it? I think you're a little bit behind the curve here on the success curve. Would you get busy? Stop no, being a slacker. I, I say that because um, I'm the first. And when I look at my friends, they have their grandpas. They have their grandmas. They know their great-grandparents. They have a history. I don't know the history. I don't know my grandpa. I don't know my great-grandpa. So I am the great grandpa, the grandpa that my future kids are going, my future kids' kids are going to be talking about. So in a first generational world that we're living in right now with millenniums that are taking back the country by fighting for a future that they want to live in, that's what we're, that's what we're going through right now. That's, where, that's what we're seeing where entrepreneurship is everything. I met a 22-year-old who made $1.2 million just doing Forex. Like, and, I, and that's where I got into the market. But, you know, here's the problem. And look, I don't want to get overly political. I try to stay out of that in a, any kind of a public forum. But we're also living at a time where people are saying what we, the answer is universal basic income. Well, in my opinion, universal basic income is about as anti-American as you could imagine. Why are we having a conversation about that as opposed to, see, there's people who create value and wealth, and there's people who capture value and wealth. Why aren't we having a conversation about creation? How do we empower more people to create the future of their choosing, socially, spiritually, emotionally, and financially? Entrepreneurship is a way out. The more entrepreneurs we have creating value, creating new technologies, new products, new services, and new categories. Here's the thing that people don't fucking understand. When one entrepreneur rises up, not only does she improve her station, very often she takes her people that work with her and for her with her. Very often she can impact a community, a category, an entire marketplace, and in some cases, an entire industry. And so our entrepreneurs in a very real way change the world for themselves and for other people. I'm a poor paper boy from Montreal who has financial freedom and has for a long time. I was the head of marketing for a publicly traded company at 27 years old. We can do this, but right now there's no conversation about that, to your point, Denarius, at a big level. I don't hear my governor talking about it. I don't hear my president talking about it. I don't hear his opposition talking about it. And so I say enough's enough. Yeah. Part of this, if you want equality, you want justice, it's economic. Well. Rather than talking about how we take the value created by some and spread it around, why not talk about how more people can create value for themselves? Yeah. And I, to piggyback off that, I, I, I say in the sense of why it's not happening at a, at a bigger level is, um, those are those are businesses, corporations. They need employees, and and, and I understand certain businesses need employees, and there's always going to be an employee structure. But even those employees can start to become an can, even an employee can can be an employer, because we are at one point we're all employees. That's like that's this ecosystem. You can still have a build a business and have your teach your business your employees entrepreneurship. The ones that want to be entrepreneur will be will want that. Those who want to be employees will be that. But you're at least giving people that knowledge and that opportunity. Right now, we don't have people that, that want to be entrepreneur have to figure it out. We have to join a network marketing company and build that drive, and that drive can be transferable to build a brick and mortar. Like 
that's and I, 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 I suggest that to people that how I got into entrepreneurship was network marketing. Listening to Eric Worre, being around those cats, uh, you know, my mentor, uh, she was friends. She was the she was friends with the wife of um, Bob Proctor. So I was really in that little niche of learning about the law of attraction, understanding that, and really, really gung ho. But not everyone's going to have that that opportunity. Not everyone's going to has the time to pick up an Eric Worre to pick up in. But everyone does have the time if they're willing to understand the direction they want to go in life. And if we don't know the direction we want to go in life, we're living unpurposely on purpose. And I agree, entrepreneurship, and I go to schools. I'm going to schools every, like before, you know, COVID, I'm at schools weekly, speaking to kids on entrepreneurship. I, a, my, a lot of my, the people who follow me on Instagram are all my, all the kids I've met at schools that they have their own Shopify store. They have their own drop shipping. They, they, I, they have their own makeup line and they want to be the next Kylie Jenner. Uh, it's so interesting. And, and including, I have a 13 year old uh, at one point, he's 15 now, but a couple years ago, um, I, I have a 13 year old um, mentee, his name is Jay Kwan Faulkner. He, his, story went, he, his, his story went viral over in, um, in North Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, he, had a, he had a lemonade stand. There's, there's, someone wanted to shut it down. It went viral. The city of Minneapolis decided to get him, get, get him a, um, a business license at 13. And his story got viral. Um, he went on Steve Harvey. Uh, Damon Jones from Shark Tank came and gave him $10,000, helped him out with some entrepreneurial stuff. And I did a GoFundMe, raised a couple thousand dollars for him as well so he could understand how to manage a business, what it, how to get a square so you can, take, you can capture all your sales because it was an all-cash business. So really educating a 13 year old how to run a business. We built a Facebook for him. Um, you, know, you can follow him on Facebook, it's thousands of likes. And, and I would take him out because at the same time, he's 13 years old. It's not, it's not always about the business. It's also being able to balance. Because as an entrepreneur, we all have to find balance. Any person has to find balance, but as an entrepreneur, we're so crazy, we sometimes are so imbalanced in our, in our direction. So when I took him out, I, 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 he didn't know how big he was because he was 13. But people just come up to him, they want to take a photo, and I'm like, you, and just educating him how to walk in the world, but not have an ego with that. Yeah, you're 13, people know you, but, like, you can't drive a car. <laughs> you can't get into a club. Like, you can't, you're not an adult, so, like, don't, don't let that go to your head. So. If you want a beer, we have to sneak it to you. <laughs> yeah, 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 literally. So, I say all that because, you know, I, I, entrepreneurship was a really big passion because it helped me understand who I am and where I'm headed and where I want to go and, you know, help my other friends. Because, you know, if I it helped me, I'm going to help others. Like, you know, like you said, we, we want to give people the, uh, if someone helped me, I'm going to show them how, to, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to return that favor. The problem in, when, when it comes to entrepreneurship at a, in a school, schools don't want to empower. Schools are meant to, te uh, to teach people, to put people into, you know, you know obviously, right? Um, to be very blunt, a sheep, an employee. And I mean, I'm an employee. I have a job, I, you know. But my entrepreneurship is getting me outside of a job. I'm, I have a, I, I have multifamily project property. So as I'm planting the seed to know, hey, all right, well, this is my time frame that I have to be an employee. And as I have my side businesses that I employ people too, it's a time frame. But it's, you know, it's Daenerys, you're on, you're on such an incredible point. There's all this talk about reforming the police, and it's it's an important discussion. We had a guy on my podcast named Ted Dintersmith. He visited schools in every state in the United States of America. He did his homework. He looked at what works and what doesn't work. And he wrote an extraordinary book called What School Could Be. And he was on exactly the points that you're on. That our school system is essentially created to produce factory workers. Everybody's another brick in the wall. It's not, our school system is not designed to create people who are financially capable, not designed to help people build a legendary career, not designed to help people become entrepreneurs or artists or, or what have you. Uh, and so, there must be a breakthrough in education. And that breakthrough, in my opinion, and I, I, I think I'm paraphrasing Ted, needs to be around agency. What he said is, start, the best schools in the United States of America at a very early age give kids the opportunity to start choosing what they want to focus on. Why would you take 
a kid and make them do equal amounts of work across all subject areas. If you have a kid who's deeply gifted in art or deeply gifted in math, why wouldn't you start tilting their education in that direction if that's what they chose? And then why wouldn't you empower and throw logs on that fire as opposed to taking a kid who's deeply passionate about history and shoving some foreign language up their ass that they don't care about? Why not have them focus on history? Maybe they're going to write books. Maybe they're going to give lectures. Maybe they're going to become incredibly, I don't know what they're, professors. I don't know what they're going to do. And so this notion that children deserve agency around their education to begin to design their lives and create their futures and adding a component around entrepreneurship. What percentage of high schools in the United States, middle schools in the United States teach entrepreneurship? It's pathetic. And so if we want to change our society, I, you're absolutely right. A huge part of this is our education system. And the only way, we, and it's, that's the only way, because even schools are right out of, a school is a business. <laughs> There's a budget. <laughs> there has to be, like, so, like, it, just to, so like, as a kid, our first games, you know, when I grew up, my first game was playing Lemonade Stand on the computer. This is like when Microsoft was being created. We played Lemonade Stand. But Lemonade Stand for me was one of the first fun, like the most entertaining games for me as a kid. Because I get to get an emery, and if I have, have all my lemonades expoiled, now I have to get new lemonade. I don't have enough cups. I have to get new cups. It was just a game that never literally ended until you made money so you could you can reinvest and have the best lemonade stand and as i hear a lot of people who have you know financial struggles entrepreneurship is that case and i navigate them down the path of getting a multi-family home getting something that's passive income and my big dream was my big dream as an entrepreneur was you know i was living pay, i'm living paycheck to paycheck to overcome bills if I'm going to be able to do that, I have to find a way to overcome my living expense. Get a multifamily home. I have a duplex. I live on one side. I have my wrenches on the other side. I live more. Wait, 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 wait. I just, I hate to interrupt you, Daenerys. Yeah. The homeless dude is collecting rent checks from his renters in his duplex. Is that what you just told me? Basically, yes. From homeless to homeowner. And that's, that's the yeah. I give. And there's two big things I have to say about that. God bless Daenerys and God bless America. That's the opportunity we have. Yeah. And there's a comment here in the chat from Shay about UBI. Uh, look, I think it's misplaced. I understand that the people who want UBI are being heart-centered about it. And I'm not trying to be cold. Here's the aha. It's a simple one. It's the old adage about you teach a person to fish versus fish giving them fish. UBI to me is giving them fish. What we need to do is take away the barriers for them to learn how to take care of themselves, to create a equal playing field, to get rid, if you read the reports, the, our, the Brookings Institute points straight at state governments that massively advantage huge corporations and fuck over entrepreneurs. We saw it recently. With, with many states falling all over themselves with tax breaks and other things for Amazon to try to get one of their two quote unquote new headquarters, whatever the hell that means. And here they are giving massive tax breaks to Amazon and screwing over small entrepreneurs. The American people bailed out Wall Street after the Great Recession. And where are the loans for small businesses? Why is access to capital in this country so fucking racist? Who's responsible for that? Why is that the case? That's wrong. And so, t and, and on UBI, why is healthcare tied to employment? One of the primary reasons people don't start companies is because they need their healthcare. Mm -hmm. so, so I say, fix the problems and enable entrepreneurship. That's what we want, not UBI. Decouple healthcare and employment. Get rid of red tape, horrible laws uh, that, that disadvantage our small businesses. Invest, take the money that you were gonna give to UBI and invest in empowering people with agency to be entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial. Invest in making it clear 
that if you get sick or hurt in this country, we're going to find a way to take care of you, whether you're employed or not, or, or whether your employer has good benefits or not good benefits. Take away the barriers for people to learn how to fish for themselves. I agree with that. I like that. And, 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 and because, like, to go back on, economic empowerment is how we're going to fix these problems. Yes, economic empowerment is a huge part of this. Yeah, and, and that's, one, that's one of the ways I'm choosing to tackle it. So that's why I'm focused on building my, uh, my real estate. So my, 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 the reason I build my, my, I focus on my real estate is I, uh, one side I live on, and the other sides I rent out to families in need. Uh, people who have trouble with their credit. I help out by people who have mental health disabilities. I have a PCA company that I, I've launched as well. Um, I say all this because there's an ecosystem of ways that we, if we have a problem with something, there's a way we can fix it. As a PCA, I've seen flaws in the system. As I've been, I've been doing it for quite some time, I was like, all right, there's going to be something that I would want to change. This is how I want to change it. Well, how's that, how, how, how do I go about doing that? I have to create a company. So now I have a subcompany that I subcontract PCAs to do some of the works on different sites and stuff like that. So it's like, if you see a problem, you can fix it. In the world of entrepreneurship, in, as an American, we're, we're, we're wearing a problem. There was a day that someone said, hey, I want to wear a shirt. And there was a solution. We're wearing people's ideas. And the thing is, people forget that ideals can manifest to real tangible things. You're, the shirt that you're wearing, the phone that we're listening to, the headphones that you have on, the mic was once upon a time, I, once upon a time someone's idea. But the courage, the enactment, and the things that they necessarily did to do, they did to make it a reality. Well, what is your dream? What are the things you want to create? Everyone in the world has, a, has something they want to do outside of trading time for money. If money was never an option, what would, you, what would life look like? It will look like flowers. It will look peaceful. Everyone has that imagination, but not enough people believe in that imagination. And what, where I like to do and help people in that sense of how do we bridge this gap of disconnect? What is the world that you want to live in? And how do we live in that world together? How do we have that conversation? Because the way that you want to be treated in your world of fantasy, of being loved and appreciated, is the same world that I want to live in as well. No matter the differences that we have. You don't have to have, like blue. I don't have to like red. But we, we can find commonality in our, in our differences. And that's how we're going to work, live amongst each other. Because we, it's not like I can just jump ship and go to, go to Mars, go to moon. It's not like that because I can run from the same problem that I am facing in Minnesota and go to a Long Beach, California, or go out to Cal and go anywhere in the world and experience the same thing because the problem is still still around. But the solution to end that problem it will be the same solution in all problems, which is how we interact with each other, how do we communicate, how we love each other, and how do we get along in compassion, empathy, learning our inner emotions because when we point fingers at someone else for their differences, they can do the same for us. You may not have enough hair. You may have too much hair. You may, you may be too old. You may be too young. We all have our differences because we have ageism. We have insecurities. One of the things I always say, we all have, we all have insecurities, but our perceptions of our insecurities limit us. So let's have the conversation of what makes you feel less. So let's, let's go back. To, so let's have a conversation of what makes you feel less so we can get back to feeling as whole. We're not feeling as whole as a country. We're feeling divided. We're feeling separate. We're, and we're feeling, and we're so separate and then we're so not, not, not equal that it's hindered our comprehensive to actually understand one another in this world. And the reason why we're having these conversations of emotional intelligence, how do we go from here? What is race? How do we go? What, what, and it's like, well, let's go back to the basics. How would you like to be treated? What is the so world Daenerys, that you want to live with? Here's another thing I want to sort of bounce off yeah. you. I was talking to my wife, Carrie, about this over the last day or so. I, I might be wrong. I want to get your reaction. All right. I, I think the vast majority of us are actually, if not united, pretty close to united. I think the vast majority of people in our country and in many countries around the world want equal opportunity. I think the vast majority of people want to see an end of racism. I think the vast majority of people hold the words of Dr. King's famous speech close to their heart. I think we want a true meritocracy. We want a world where we are judged by our values and our actions. Um, 
I, I think most of us want that. Now, there's a lot of arguing in the details of how we get there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wonder is this division that's being created right now, this yelling. We had this guy on, on my podcast a while back called Buster Bronson, who wrote a book called Why Are We Yelling? Uh, is really from a small fringe on either side and is stoked by a media who makes money when we get mad, um, both the social media and the traditional media, because when we're mad and we post things and all that, their eyeballs go up. And when they're screaming and yelling about what assholes the quote unquote other side are, their viewership goes up. And uh, I'm sure like you, I have people that I love who are on a completely different political side to me, but who share, if not all, the vast majority of my core values. And so I, I really believe it's time to get united. I mean, what I love about what's happening today after the tragic murder of George Floyd to the point we were on earlier is I think many of us feel much more included in the conversation than we ever did. And we can argue, you know, there's people in the chat saying they agree with me about entrepreneurship, but don't agree with me about UBI. Okay. I, I, I think UBI is insane, but let's talk about it because the issue isn't UBI. The issue is how do we create a country and ultimately a world of equality, of equal opportunity, of justice, of peace, of a real fucking meritocracy, uh, in the case of entrepreneurship, access to capital for all, right? Access to opportunity for all. How do we do that? Okay, so let's argue about UBI. Let's argue about what the priorities are. I can hear a conversation called, well, if we had UBI, maybe I could take more risk and start a company, you know? Okay, I can hear that. I disagree with it, but let's talk about it. By the way, if I'm wrong, and that is the answer, then I'll say, fuck, I was wrong, and I'm really glad we got to the answer. Because I, I guess my point, Denarius, is I think the vast majority of us, with the exception of insane fucking psychopaths on far ends of either side, want the same things. We want to walk down the street and be safe, right? I live in a community where we say good morning and hello when we walk by each other. The average American doesn't know their neighbors. I know all my neighbors. Right? right now, our blueberries are going off. We're sharing blueberries with our neighbors. Right? That's, that's the way we want to live with each other. And I'm okay with us arguing about the specifics and the details. But there's some true norths that I think the vast majority of us agree on or are very close on. And why can't we have a conversation about that? And sure, I'm okay with having a heated argument about UBI if you want to have one with me. That's okay. Or healthcare or immigration. You say, okay, immigration. I mean, you say immigration in this country, everybody goes, ah, okay, well, slow down. Don't we all agree? Don't we all agree that this is a country of immigrants? Unless you're a Native American, you're a fucking immigrant, okay? Now, I'm a naturalized American. I sat there and cried at my citizenship ceremony, as did the 2,000 people in the room with me, some of whom were from countries whose names I'd never even heard. And many were not from wonderful countries like Canada. Many were refugees. Many were running from tyranny of one sort or another because our country is a beacon of freedom and opportunity. Isn't that what we want? So on immigration, I think most of us agree we want to be a beacon of opportunity. I think most of us agree we want to attract the best and the brightest if they want to come here. I think most of us agree that we need to have checks and balances in place to make sure that criminals don't fucking come here. And that we do have borders that are strong. And that we do have control over what happens in terms of who comes in and who doesn't. And at the same time, we are benevolent and we are big hearted as it relates to people in need who come here in desperation. Don't we all agree about that? Now, how we get that done and what that means and what we should do about this, that, and the other, yes, let's have all the arguments about that. 
But I think we can agree that this is a country of immigrants. We want to be benevolent, and yet we want to have, we want to be wise about who we let in and who we don't. And yet, to Buster's point, we're all yelling about that. I think we should argue the fine points and work at the details and compromise and educate each other and so forth, just like is happening right now. But don't we all agree? Don't we all agree? And it's the details we're arguing about instead of what's happening, which is fringe groups on either side trying to pull us apart when in point of fact, we're united. Did I lose you, Denarius? <laughs> no, no, you didn't. No, I, I had to. I had to take a moment to listen to you. You sounds like a sermon. You're, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, you're preaching, and I'm just, I'm listening. And it's a. So my question to you is, what do you feel is the next step? What do you do? You do you believe in like in a very general sense that uh, that we're going to be there's going to be that do you see a future where we're treating each other as we hope has hoped? Totally imagine. And I say that in a, in a world, in a sense, like, do you believe that we're going to come to a, where society is going to be a society as we really wanted it to be? Or is this going to be a never ending cycle conversation where uh, the powers of evil continue to reign free and we're still having this conversation in 2100? So, um, will we get it together? Do you feel that, like, in, as an opinion? So let me be uh, brutally candid with you, Denarius. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There have been many, many moments since my brother was murdered. There have been many, many moments since the tragedy of C-19 and the economic destruction and the massive, horrible loss of life and suffering and now, since the brutal murder of George, when you stack all that shit on top of all that shit, um, I have had more pain, more nightmares, and more mornings where I don't want to get out of bed in the last eight months than I've ever had in my life. I have felt massively defeated by the size and the scope of this suffering. And I am not a person who gets defeated. Uh, I have cried uncontrollably. I have had to call friends and therapists. I have had to consume massive amounts of whiskey and pot to deal with the last eight or nine months. And I still feel defeated a lot. So that's the first part of my personal reality. And I would be full of shit if I didn't acknowledge that. And there's an old story. I don't think it's a true story, but it's a wonderful story that I hold on to. Sometimes it doesn't help, but often it does. And the story goes like this. There's a little girl who lives near a beach and one day there's a giant storm and it washes up tens of thousands of starship, uh, starfish on the beach. And she goes out and she starts picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the ocean. And as she's doing this, a man comes up to her and says, little girl, what are you doing? She says, well, I'm throwing the starfish back into the ocean to try and save them. And he says, there's thousands of starfish on the beach. How can you possibly make a difference? The little girl bends down, picks up a starfish, throws it into the ocean, and looks up at the man said, made a difference to that one. And so... Here's what I know. The future is up to us. The future isn't just going to happen. Every evil thing that ever happened was done by a human being. 
And every legendary thing that ever happened was done by a human being. And there have been human beings just like you and me who made a gigantic difference. Dr. King got up every morning, had a coffee, took a poop and put on his pants, just like you and I. He was just a person. So what I know for sure, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, Denarius, but I know for sure this, if those of us who give a shit about humanity, equality, opportunity, entrepreneurship, justice, stand up and walk the streets and paddle out and have conversations like this with each other. There'll be a lot of people on that beach throwing a lot of starfish into the water. And there are many of us who are not in a position to help. And I understand that when you're in so much pain or you're experiencing poverty or the soul crushing tears that you cry every day because your loved one just got murdered, put you in a position where you got to do everything you can just to hold your own shit together. I understand that. And if you're a person who can help, you could stand up. If you can speak to your wrestling point earlier, if you can see the light even on the ground, if you're in a position to write checks in the last week, Carrie and I have written checks to the NAACP and to Damon's family. Um, then do those things. Because we are all gonna have to answer the question, what did you do during this crisis? Who were you? If you're a business leader or business owner, your company's gonna have to answer the question, did you stand for good, not evil? John Mellencamp sang, you got to stand for something or you're going to fall for anything. And so I think we take a stand and I think we take that stand together, together. We include each other. I don't mean to be overly critical, but my personal feeling with the Me Too movement was it was necessary and it was not inclusive. I personally could not find a place to stand in, in that. And um, I can tell you how many women's asses I have grabbed. Zero. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be overly critical, but what I love about what's happening now is I think there is a place for all of us to stand in this discussion about equality and justice and racism and brutality. A mistake that we could make is to be against the police. That's a giant mistake. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, Sheriff Jim Hart is a very good man. The countless people at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department who brought those four killers to justice are very good people. Do you know that when they captured the psychopathic maniac on Sunday, they shot him, but they didn't kill him. They shot him, took him into custody and brought that, that fucker to the hospital. They could have turned off their body cams and emptied clips into them. They didn't do that. So we all have a place to stand. And now's the time for us to take a stand. And if enough of us throw starfish into the water, we're going to get there. And so I think all there is for us to do is to focus on the we 
not the us versus them, make it okay for those of us who are, were not lucky enough to be born of color, to wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, and more importantly, behave in a way that's gonna make a difference, to vote in a way that's gonna make a difference, to contribute financially and many other ways that are gonna make a difference. You know, for example, I've been trying to find a black marketing group, you know, like a giant mastermind of black marketeers. I haven't been able to find one. And a, a black female marketing executive said to me, well, why don't you start one? <laughs> <laughs> well, can a white guy start a black group for, <laughs> for black marketers? I don't know. Maybe today I can. <laughs> and that's the kind of conversation in areas I think we have to have. And look, I can't breathe either. I fucking had it. The gun violence in America has to stop. The violence against all people in this country is off the fucking charts. And so enough's enough on the violence. Enough's enough. We have to create a meritocracy. Go back and read the Constitution. Read the Gettysburg Address. I have in the last week. When Lincoln stood up at the Gettysburg Address, he doubled down on the vision and the promise that is the United States. Now is an opportunity for us to decide, do we really believe in those things? When I became an American citizen, I took an oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all. Native-born Americans don't have to take that oath. I did. I take it seriously. And so I think now's the time for us to stand up. Now's the time for us to spark entrepreneurship. And there's one other big idea I have for everybody today, and it's not my idea. In the past, we had Sebastian Younger, the incredible war correspondent author, on my podcast. And we've had four-star General Stanley McChrystal on the podcast a couple times. Both of them made the same point. The United States of America is a country that gives much to its citizens. An opportunity like is not possible in almost every other country in the world. And yet it asks nothing of us. Both General McChrystal, or as how he likes to be called, Stan, <laughs> um, and Sebastian Younger said the same thing. A powerful thing we could do in this country is at age 18, either require or request people commit a year or two of their lives to the service of this country. And they could pick from a whole number of things they could do. They could serve our military. They could build homes with habitat for humanity or any number of other unbelievable things, clean up our inner cities, fix our potholes, clean up our beaches or whatever other good works support our elderly. There are many, many, many causes. You know, one of my favorite expressions, Denarius, is there are too many causes without a rebel. And so what the general and what, what, what Sebastian are saying is if we were to institute a national program of service, it would change everything. It would create a powerful sense of us. And that's what we need. We need to come together. Legends unite. It's time to unite this country. It's time to do things together to make a difference. It's time to take being a citizen seriously. We forget there's no such thing as the United States. It doesn't exist. It only exists in our speaking, in our actions, and in the way we treat each other. The United States is a made up idea. It's culture and culture gets created every day by who we are, what we do, and how we are with each other. So the future of the United States and the future of the world is not somebody else's. It's ours. It's up to us. And we have an opportunity 
as a result of this horrible killing to come together and say, we are not going to stand for this brutality and this division and this racism and this injustice anymore. We are creating a different future. Because I know tears have no color and opportunity shouldn't either. This has been beautiful, guys. Hopefully, I think you guys can still hear me. Um, and uh, a wonderful conversation. I was just chatting with Tim about how remarkable this has been. And um, in, the, in the honor or in the, in the sake of honoring people's time, I'm going to encourage everybody to go out and uh, follow Christopher Lockhead. on. He has a, a podcast. It's called Lockhead on Marketing. Um, in the show notes, we're going to put Daenerys' Facebook and Instagram. Um, sounds like you're going to be hopping back into the social media world. I know for a while you, you know, it, it's a great place to stay connected and, uh, and the rest of you, you know, encourage you guys to go in and, and continue the conversation that we had today and, um, you know, see where this, see where this sparks and, 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 and check in with us in the one life community. Let us know what, what you're doing, uh, personally, uh, with your family, with your business, or, uh, even, um, you know, on a, on a local or, or systemic level, what. Uh, you're doing to get involved. We'd love to hear uh, those stories as well. Thank you, Christopher, Daenerys. Um, this Thank has you. Been an, an enlightening, uh, so many adjectives, but remarkable, I think, for sure. So um, we appreciate all of you. Go make a, a positive difference and keep dreaming, planning, and living your one life fully lived. We'll see you guys next week, same time, Monday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. Later, guys. <laughs>